We're going to read some verses here uh, from John chapter 1. And we'll just commence to read from verse 10. Speaking of Christ, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. End our reading there. Let's just take a moment to beseech God for His blessing upon this aspect. Lord, we give thanks for everything prior to this point. We have sensed real joy, collective joy, uh, in this house tonight already. A joy to praise Thy name, delight in the truths that we utter through song. And we thank Thee for what it means to us to be able to sing from the heart. We thank Thee for a renewed heart. We thank Thee for a new heart. Thou hast taken away the stony heart and given us an heart of flesh. What a mighty miracle. What a blessed gift that Thou hast given to us. But Lord, we ask now that Thou wilt help us in the Word. For in this we need divine help. Help for the hearer, help for the preacher. And so we ask that thou wilt not turn thyself away from us, but that thou wilt draw very near and give us the anointing, the promised unction of God. If ye, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Lord, we cannot buy it. We just ask. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. May His presence and work be known in the saving of souls and the building of the flock. Hear prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text for this evening is verse 14. John 1 verse 14. And while in previous weeks we've taken the time to deal with a number of verses, I felt this text needed concentration upon it alone. We have here in these words... Uh, of verse 14, a pointer and reminder of what John has already declared. He says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And if you've been following uh, in the chapter, and you know the chapter well, you'll know that this reference, this title of the Word, points us back to what he says at the beginning of the chapter, when he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we saw already how this title, the Word, is uniquely given to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, when you go through the Word of God, you will find that it is, it is a title that only John uses in his writings. He uses it in his Gospel here. He uses it in 1 John. And there's also reference to it uh, in the book of Revelation as well. And we noted uh, right at the beginning how John begins very deliberately as all the writers do, did and do. Uh, but here he deliberately gets our mind thinking about the book of Genesis. You'll know that if you know the book of Genesis at all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and so on. Well, he's using the exact same language as he commences his book, his gospel. He says, in the beginning was the Word. And he, it's not by accident. He is trying to get us to think about what is said in the book of Genesis. And the whole meaning, the whole purpose of how John begins is to help us understand that whenever we find the repetition of God said, let there be light, God said, so on and so forth, I think some ten occasions we find, and God said, that what actually was occurring there was the second person of the triune God, he who has given this title, the Word, he was the one who was proactively fulfilling the will of God. He is the great creator. He is the one who is the word. So as God speaks, the second person acts and fulfills the spoken word or is the spoken word and fulfills the will of God. And so he is the great creator. 
And this is why there's no contradiction when we see that God created. And then in the New Testament, we find out that Jesus Christ created all things. Uh, Colossians 1.16 and other places where we find out that Jesus Christ is the Creator. For He is the Word. He is the Word of God. This is a title given to Him. So we understand that when God speaks, there we have a revelation of Jesus Christ. He is unique. He is not a created being. And the language of the opening verses of this chapter that I don't want to rehash too much, but they make that absolutely plain that He is God. And when we think about Him and His unique role as the Son of God, because each of the persons of the Godhead carry out distinct ministries, distinct work, well, Jesus Christ has His distinct work. He is, first of all, the prophet of God, the great prophet of God. All the other prophets merely pointed to Him. He is the fulfillment of what Moses declared and prophesied in Deuteronomy 18.15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. And so there's this prophecy of Jesus Christ being a prophet. And so when we see him given the title of the word, that is pointing to this, this aspect of his ministry. The prophet was one who spoke the word, who delivered God's word. And Jesus Christ is the great prophet, delivering the mind and word of God. And he is the last word from God. God has nothing more to say than what has been said in Jesus Christ. We don't believe in extra biblical prophecies. We don't believe in people coming and saying, God said this and God has declared that. As A.W. Tozer said, if an angel from heaven comes to you with a 12-foot wingspan and says, God says, you ask him for a book, chapter, and verse. Because Jesus is the final word. This is the declaration in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, that God hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. The last days being the New Testament age, the period from the, the ministry of Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection, right until His second coming. And God has nothing more to say. If a man is sitting here, if any person is sitting here tonight and you say, well, if God would only say this to me, if God would only do that, I'm here to tell you that your search will be in vain. What God wants you to know has already been declared. It is in Jesus Christ and it's in the pages of this book. He is the prophet of God. He is the revealer of God. That is, God revealing himself only reveals himself in Jesus Christ. I quoted it in the opening prayer. Uh, it's a text from the book of Colossians that in him, that is in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All of God is dwelling in Jesus Christ. And so you cannot find out anything about God outside of Jesus Christ and anything you're going to discover about God will be in Jesus Christ. There is no place to go and find anything out outside of Him about God. I know there are those today and in their mystical desires, they think, well, maybe God has something else to say to me, to show to me. And there is a mix, and always has been, heresy of a mixing of Christianity with mysticism and belief that there is something else that God has to communicate to us outside of the Word. But this is nonsense. It's nonsense. Jesus Christ is the revealer of God. If you want to know God, you get to know Jesus Christ. This is revealed. I've quoted it many times, and I'll probably quote it many times uh, in the future as well. In the great high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ in John 17 and verse 3, what does he pray? That they might know thee, the only true God. Now that's what we want. We want to know God. And it is reflected in the prayer of Jesus Christ that He wants us to know God. He wants us to know God, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou didst send. And it's very clear that in order to know God, we must know Jesus Christ. He is the one who reveals God to us. We can't know anything about God outside of Him. Our search will be in vain. He is also the message of God. 
And that's not to say that he, bring, he, he just brings us God's message. That's true. He brings us God's message. But more than that, he is God's message. He is God's message. This is drawing already from what we've already been articulating. He is the message of God. He has given the title in the book of Revelation of being Alpha and Omega. Many of you will know that's the, the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Alpha and Omega. He is the alphabet. He is the one who is the message of God. I mean, we, mean from, we talk about from A to Z. That's, that's, and everything in between. We, we mean everything is involved there. It is the A to Z. and uh, Even Amazon, uh, the little logo for Amazon online, it has a little arrow that goes from A to the Z. Uh, it's pointing, showing that the, the purpose of their marketplace is to have everything from A to Z. Anything you can imagine their marketplace will provide. You look at it, maybe you haven't noticed it. The little logo there, when you go on to Amazon.ca or .com or whatever, you'll see there's a little arrow that goes from the A to the Z. And that's their intention, to show you that they want to provide everything. Well, Jesus Christ is everything with regard to God. He is Alpha and Omega. And God has no other message outside of Him. He is the one that we look to then to discover what God has declared. And the fact is, beloved, and all those who are gathered, that He is an exclusive message. There is no other way to God. That's unpopular today. Because you can't be a Christian as long as you permit others to have their religion as well. You can be a Christian and declare yourself a Christian, providing that you don't come on too strongly about every other person's need to receive Jesus Christ, and as long as you accept the fact that there are other ways to God. As if getting to know God was the spokes on a wheel, and there are many spokes, but they all lead into the one little hub, that being God. And that's how many try to perceive it. And many even so-called Protestant preachers and ministers stand in their pulpits and declare themselves Christian. And yet, when you interview them and you ask them, as many do, and I'm not going to start articulating names. I've done that enough in the past. You know, there are many, many, and you can, you can find them all over the place. And they will continue to come and continue to raise their heads. And many of them started well. And they were very resolute and orthodox doctrine and teaching, but as time goes on, especially if they start getting a lot of attention from the media, becoming very popular, then the heat is on them and they begin to break. They begin to mold. They begin to conform and change how they articulate the gospel and stop holding to an exclusive message that Jesus is the only way. But I'm here to tell you that that is the truth. Jesus Christ declared plainly, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You can't get through Buddha. You can't get through Muhammad. You can't get through whatever God you desire to mention. Christ alone is the exclusive way to God. The only way. The world is a world of darkness and confusion. And it's only made worse by the cry that there is many ways to God. Because we have to choose one, don't we? We can't just accept them all. We can't live out every religion. Because every religion requires different things from us and we would live an impossible contradictory life if we tried to live and adhere by every religion. So we have to adhere to one. We have to lay hold upon one. We have to choose one. And if then we have to choose one, the question is, well, what's the best one? How do we know what the best one is? How, what one really leads me to God? And if we take the idea that so many have, that there are many choices and you can choose any, it leaves us in more confusion and in more darkness. Driven about with every wind of doctrine, to use the language of the apostle. But Jesus Christ has made it clear. And the apostles made it clear. Standing there, Peter declares, Neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12. There's no other person to look to. And so God comes with a crystal clear message through the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, and lays out before man, you're in need of salvation, of redemption, of reconciliation with your God. Christ is the answer. And the only answer. 
God's not confused about it. He has made it absolutely plain. And so tonight, as we look here at John 1.14, for the time that remains, I want us to consider vital truths of a viable Savior. Vital truths of a viable Savior. Jesus Christ is the viable Savior, and there are truths revealed here in this verse that I want us to take time to think about. First of all, the truth of His miraculous incarnation. Look at verse 14. And the Word was made flesh. Made flesh. Here He draws our mind. He's been drawing already. Uh, or rather, he, he, he starts to draw this title that He used at the commencement of His writing. He draws from it again, and He says, The Word was made flesh. And in fact, many have used, uh, have really went from verse 1 and skipped down to verse 14 to help us to see that the Word is Jesus Christ and is the one who came into the world. And verse 14 further opens up what has been already dealt with in the opening verses. And here it draws home or brings home to our hearts the, the incarnation of the Son of God. In order to save us, God must take man's nature. It's an absolute necessity. There is no way for God to save man without becoming man. Had it been possible, then that would have been the path that was taken. Because as we shall see, the incarnation is the greatest humiliation and condescension that we can even fathom. It's beyond what we can fathom. Had there been another way, there would be another way. But there was no other way. In order to save man, God had to take on the form of man, and that he did. He became flesh. That's how John puts it explicitly, making it understood. The Word, he who was eternal, he who is divine, becomes flesh. It took a miraculous person to save men from their sins. It required what theologians call the hypostatic union. You say, oh, big words. Well, basically, the hypostatic union simply is a term that refers to the union of the two natures, deity and humanity. And it makes it clear that that union wasn't a union where they mingled the natures. Uh, it wasn't a union where it was 50% God and 50% man. It is 100% God, 100% man, Two distinct natures combining in one person forever. The hypostatic union of the Son of God. And this is necessary. This is necessary for the redemption of man. Without this, we're all lost. Without God becoming man, there's no hope. And the whole, the whole declaration of the Old Testament is about this. The very first prophecy after the fall of what man needed to deliver them and to reverse the effects of the fall, what was it? Genesis 3.15, The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. Right there God's saying it's going to be necessary for man to do the work. And it's further revealed, of course, that this man is also God. And there it is, these two natures working in order to save men. But right there and then, God's saying, an angel can't do it. And God can't do it and, and hold just to his deity. God must become man. There must be the human aspect to save mankind, to rightly represent mankind. And if this didn't happen, there's no way to heaven. And of course, this doctrine is hated. Hated. I've articulated this already at the beginning of this series. They hate people, hate the, the fact that we declare that God became man. They, they want to see the humanity. They want to understand the humanity. They have no problem with the humanity of Jesus Christ. Usually there are some sects who even uh, disregard that. I'm not going to get into that tonight. But there are those. I mean, it's amazing the diversions upon Scripture that there are and exist to this day. If there's a way, if there's a way of distorting the truth, man will find it out. There's a way that seemeth, on, seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Every heresy conceivable is here. I mean, and every, every new heresy that arises tends to be just a rehashing of an old heresy. 
And so all these sects and religions, they hate, they hate the, the, the declaration of the deity of Jesus Christ. If they can keep him just a man, they can deal with that. Even Mohammedism, they're fine with the fact he's a man, a prophet, a great prophet. They can acknowledge that. But when you say he's God, they can't accept that. They can't accept that. And so it is for many. And of course, this is a foundational doctrine, a bedrock of our faith, and we cannot let it go. We can't deny it without denying the whole gospel and plunging ourselves into eternal damnation. We can't. And this is the reason for the existence of the Free Presbyterian Church, at least in part. When the, the Free Presbyterian Church came into existence back in Northern Ireland over 60 years ago, the reason, one of the reasons, one of the re main reasons was because the, the Irish Presbyterian Church took their college professor, their great professor, Davy, and they exonerated him by making him moderator of their denomination. A man who unashamedly denied the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, as well as other heresies. And so there were believers who could not stand for that. There were believers who would not sit there and let that happen. There were believers who refused to accept that we can ex exonerate and we can, we can exalt a man like that who denies bedrock gospel truths and pretend that we continue to exhibit the, 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 a representation of the true church of Jesus Christ. And they came away. The man who denies this doctrine, the doctrine of the deity of Christ and the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and these things, they deny their right to heaven. They damn their souls. And this is the miracle of all miracles. The Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh. I don't think we get all that. And certain, as, well, I know for a fact we don't get all that's encapsulated there. We can't conceive it. But even what we can't understand. Even the Apostle Paul says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 Great is the mystery of godliness. What does he mean there? Mystery, when you read the New Testament, the word mystery, very often, if not always, certainly very often, don't want to be too dogmatic there, but very often when you read the word mystery, what it is, is a truth that has been revealed by God that man would never have known otherwise. And so the, the, the coming of Jesus Christ and the Jesus Christ being both God and man, man couldn't conceive that or understand that. God had to reveal it. And so Paul declares, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest, was revealed in flesh. As John says, the Word was made flesh. And that is a miracle that exceeds the very creation of the world out of nothing. It exceeds all of that. There is not a miracle that you can fathom that exceeds that miracle there. What you read in that verse, looking at it, the Word was made flesh. What a miracle. This truth, as I said, is a bedrock. And only God had the attributes to save the soul. God had to become man. And so this is the great condescension. When you look at verse 1 and you see who the Word really was, as we've seen already, in the beginning was the Word. That is, He was before the beginning. That means he's eternal. And the word was with God. That means he's a person. He's with God. He's eternal. He's personal. And he was God. He is deity. The eternality, the personality, and the deity of, of the Son of God, of the word, is right there. And when you take that exalted position, and you, 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 you take time to meditate, there is no loftier being in the whole of the universe and he condescends to be man. We couldn't buy his favor. We couldn't earn his favor. We could do nothing to call his favor. In fact, we didn't even want his favor if we rightly understand our depraved natures. Every man going about doing that which is right in his own eyes. Men loving darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And without God stepping in, they continue on a path rejecting Jesus Christ, God, and all truth without any concern for their souls. But God takes the initiative. God steps in. God becomes man to save. And I wonder that I preach it without shedding a tear. The 
It is not easy to explain. The Word was made flesh. Sometime we may dwell more on this incarnation, doctrinally speaking, but it is there for us to accept. And we cannot deny it, as I've said already, without robbing ourselves of eternal peace. And here John is saying, this one who is God became man. And the rest of the gospel, once he steps out of the prologue, once he steps out of the introduction after verse 18, he's going to not just declare that God became flesh, he's going to prove it. He's going to show it. He's going to show that here was a man who actually lived, but this man was also God. And how everybody could see the difference between him and others. What a condescension. It ought to amaze us. The Word was made flesh, just those words. His miraculous incarnation. Then secondly, His marvelous visitation. Because it said, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Dwelt among us. This is God stepping in to intervene. Not just becoming man and standing afar off, but actually dwelling among us. Actually coming right into our problems. Right into the, where the, the heart of the issue is. Here upon the earth where man dwells. And we read various scriptures and we see the reasons why he came. And we can't give all those verses. But for example, we're told in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, he came to destroy the works of the devil. Recognizing that there's an enemy who right from the beginning, the father of lies, sought to destroy man. And did so very effectively. Robbed us of our communion with God. Robbed us of, of the, I speak of us referring to humanity. Robbed us of free access to God's presence. Robbed us of communion with the Almighty. Robbed us of all these things, all these blessings. Leaving us in an absolutely hopeless state. And Jesus Christ comes to destroy the works of the devil. To destroy his impact, his influence. The product of his work. Not only to destroy the works of the devil, but to reverse the effects of the fall. Uh, we find in Revelation 21 how this is all going to happen. A complete reversal of what has occurred as a result of the fall. Revelation 21, and we'll read from verse 4. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. It's hard to imagine that life, isn't it? Maybe not for the young ones, but for those who have been on and are a little further on in years, you think of all the hurt and pain in life, God shall wipe away all tears, no more death, no sorrow, no crying, no more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. This is the work of Jesus Christ. Not just to redeem us, but to actually reverse product of the fall, to change that which we find so normal here in this life. We can't even really understand what it's going to be like to live in a life or an existence where everything we're so familiar with is gone forever. But so it shall be. And he also came to satisfy the demands of God's law. He came to fulfill the law. He came to represent us as our substitute because the law became... I was going to say an enemy, that might not be perfectly correct, but it certainly became something that was a problem to humanity. The law is good. The law was never a problem before until we broke it. And having broken the law, the law then calls out for our condemnation. It calls out for justice. It calls out for judgment. That law continues to this day. The moral law of God, that which reflects the very heart of God, a God who wants all worship to go to Him. A God who doesn't want us to make any idols or graven images. A God who desires us to honor our parents, honor authority. A God who wants us to be single in our love and not uh, unfaithful and committing adultery. 
A God who doesn't like us or desire us to lie. A God who doesn't want us to steal. A God who doesn't want us to bear, uh, or rather covet the things of others. All these things merely reflecting in little seed form the heart of a holy God. That law continues condemning us. Condemning us all. The law hangs over all of our heads and says you're guilty. You're guilty. And if you're here tonight and you're not in Christ, you need to get a hold of that. You're guilty. It's not a matter of living out your life and then sometime you may be guilty when you commit some great sin. You are guilty now. You were born guilty as a result of the fall. But the message of the gospel is Christ came to reverse that and to fulfill the law, not to do away with the law, not to say, oh, in some kind of way, persuade God to abandon his law, abandon his nature. No, that would be unjust. You wouldn't want that here in the nation, would you? Someone comes and steals your car, and the judge decides, well, we'll just do away with the law in this case and forget about it. No, you want the law to stand. You want justice. You're made in the image of God, and justice is part of your nature. Your conscience is always telling you that there is a law. God has created a certain standard, and you expect it to be upheld in regards to others who offend you. But it will also be upheld to you. And you're guilty. Just as we all are. Guilty. And Christ came to fulfill the law. Perfectly. He was made flesh and dwelt among us, not to just play games. Dwelt among us to fulfill the law of God. To be perfect, spotless, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Not living as we live, but living for us on our behalf. And the language here, where it says he dwelt among us, is very interesting because it can be translated dwelt as in a tabernacle among us. It has the idea of a tent or a tabernacle in the sense of him being among us. And this is John drawing out the fact that he was God, but he took the tabernacle of flesh. And this reminds us, of course, of Moses, doesn't it? Reminds us of what was set up there in the Old Testament as Israel moved around the wilderness and there was this tabernacle and place where they worshipped God and God met with men. That's what it was for, wasn't it? For God to meet with man and man to meet with God. And they had a representative, a priest, who would stand on behalf of man and make sacrifices for their sins and reconcile them to God. And Jesus Christ comes and He is that tabernacle. God taking the tabernacle of flesh. What to do so that God and man can be reconciled? That's why He became man. I wonder, do you realize it? I wonder, do those of you who are unsaved realize it? Realize that there needs to be a reconciliation. And reconciliation is only on the grounds of Jesus Christ. And He has taken this role. He has taken this role to be the tabernacle, to be the place where God meets with man. And He stands there as a mediator, the language that Paul uses. A mediator. One who stands there between God and men and brings us together. And so if in your heart of hearts there is this desire to have peace with God, there's some sense of want and yearning to have your conscience appeased and know that, that God is nothing against you anymore. A longing to be set free from guilt. A desire to know, to know that all is well with your soul. Come the day when the thread of life is snapped in your account, whenever that may be, you will know. You will know you've already obtained peace with God. That peace with God is only through our Lord Jesus Christ. Only. He came to be the tabernacle, the great high priest, the great mediator, to bring us to God. He is the glory. What does it tell us? We beheld His glory. His glory. Is there any glory in humanity? No. But they could see the glory of deity beaming from Jesus Christ. Even His enemies, even those who didn't want to acknowledge it, could see it. 
Nicodemus comes and says, No man doeth these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. You're different to us. We behold your glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That is the one appointed by the Father. He is the Father's answer for man's need. He is the one set aside for salvation. Salvation is a triune decision, a triune work, and it is the work of the Word particularly to purchase salvation for men. And that's what He does. And thirdly and finally, His merciful provision, full of grace and truth. Is that not what we need? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. That's the need of all sinners, grace and truth. It's not a religion you need, my friend. It's not a set of rules and regulations. Rules and regulations can't provide grace and truth. Religion can't provide grace and truth. You adhere to it all you want, but it doesn't actually distribute, provide grace and truth. Certainly not grace. It has no way of distributing that to your heart. It's just a religion. It's just a set of rules and regulations that you adhere to. You need a person to distribute grace. You need a person to give you grace. And you need one who is full of grace so that you know that no matter how much grace he gives to others, he also has sufficient for you too. And this is the glory of the cross. For though thousands and millions have come before you, still there's room for you. Still, there's provision for all sinners who will only believe. And tonight, if in your heart there is this longing, oh, to be right with God, know that in Jesus Christ there's one who's full of grace and full of truth. And His call to you isn't to wait. His call to you isn't to think about it. His call to you isn't to go on through your life and maybe at the end of life on your bed, As you think about dying, you wonder about dying, you think you're going to die, maybe then call upon the name of the Lord. No! His invitation is to come now. Come now. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I'll take your guilt, I'll take your condemnation, and I'll wipe the slate clean by my atoning sacrifice, by my death upon the cross, You are set free. Set free. All are set free. He is full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. And you can depend upon Him. Any desire at all in your heart any inkling or notion that is telling you and persuading you and making you think, you know, I'd like to be a Christian. I'd like to know Jesus Christ in the way that has been declared this evening. I want to know Him not just in an intellectual way where I know about Him and what He did. I want to know Him intimately. I want to be able to say, He is my God, He is my Savior. I want to be able to understand that. If that is the cry of your heart, you talk to us. You speak to us. Don't go away and and wonder about these things. Take action. We'll be glad to sit down with you. Talk with you. Make sure you know exactly what it's all about. Pray with you. And above all, point you to one who is mighty to save and mighty to deliver. Let's bow together in prayer.